uh, the last thing here um, we wanted to think about was was offering folks an introduction to the API. Um, and so this last section is mostly going to be about how you actually can access a bunch of this data uh, with code, particularly in Python. Um, so uh, this is a section if you're interested in automating some workflows or just finding out what's possible with the API or how to do it. Uh, this is a good time to think about questions uh, that are related to that. If you uh, feel bewildered by Python or code in some way, then this section may not be the most relevant to you. Um, so, uh, and again, it's also something that we're recording so that you can come back to um, if you get to a point where you want to be doing that. Okay. So the way I want to structure this is I'm going to, I set up a series of uh, notebooks um, and these are all with demonstrations of all the different things you can do with the API. Not all, but a lot of the different things you can do with the API. And we'll maintain this as a resource for how to do things. Uh, these notebooks are shared in a repository that I posted a link of, which I'll post again. And what I want to do is I'm going to walk through some of these, just showing you the basics of it. And then I would like, if you have a particular need that you're thinking about automating, uh, we could think about how to workshop that, like how you could actually do that with the API as a way to think about it. So let me just share my screen here. If that's the right window. There we go. Okay, so you should be seeing now a GitHub repository. Uh, that's the link I just posted. Um, and oh, let me get my, uh, my chat so I can make sure I see any questions. Okay. And what you can do here is uh, if you have notebooks set up on your computer already, you can just uh, clone this repository and open it. But to make this much easier, we added a little link to Binder where it can run a virtual environment of your notebooks. So if you click that, um, in two or three minutes, you end up with a web page that looks like this. Um, so click the Launch Binder button there, um, and you'll get a, a fully set up environment with all the correct dependencies and requirements that is a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so uh, do that in the background while I get started. And the one thing I want to talk through is I've set up a whole bunch of different notebooks Oops, here on the left. And they're just numbered so I can refer to them easily in order. And the first one, which is called Setup, if you double click on it, if you haven't used Jupyter Lab before, it's like Jupyter Notebooks, but just tabbed. Um, so this is Jupyter Lab, and you see all my files are here. And what this is, it has a little background information about how to find your API key and stuff. But the key thing you need to do here is grab your API key and follow these instructions here. Um, so uh, the way you get your API key is you go over to one of the websites. So if you go over to Explorer um, and you're logged in, you go over to your profile and your API, your API key right there. So that's my API key, so I'll just click it off the screen. Um, and then what you want to do is uh, there's a hidden file in here called .env. So as the instructions say, you go to file, open from path, you type in .env, opens that file, you paste your API key in. Okay, so that's how we're gonna have your API key used for all of these queries. So if you're following along, those instructions are right here. Um, and that's how you can get your API key into this particular virtual environment. Um, it's worth mentioning that this binder hosting is free, so this virtual machine will disappear after some amount of time. I don't remember if it's like based on how often you use it or not, but this is a temporary place, a temporary playground for you. If you wanna set up a more permanent playground, you should set it up on your machine with Anaconda or something. Um, but this is a good place to try things out very quickly. So all this does is, um, is just make sure that it's working. So this cell right here basically loads up that .m file and it says, okay, I'm gonna make that API key accessible to all the commands. And then this, this next cell is the one where we finally get into using our API. And we have a Python API client that's just called Media Cloud. And it's actually what we use to build all of our web interfaces. So anything you see on the web is done via the API. Now, of course, you can't do everything. Um, it's, all in the, uh, it's all set up as uh, via whether you're an admin or not. So there's certain things in the, AP, in the web tools that only we can do, but everything on there is built through that API client. So I see a question here. Is this the same if I have a Jupyter Notebook on my computer? So if you're using Jupyter Notebook on your computer, you can do a couple things. One, you can, anytime we load the API, you can just paste in the API yourself. You can also expose an environment variable uh, yourself. 
that's called MCAPI key, or you can just create the .m file and use it. So yes, it will work the same on your local computer um, if you just uh, set up the .m file and paste your API key in there. That should work the same. Actually, that's what I do. I use it locally on my computer. Um, so uh, right here, we're just doing a couple of standard imports for, um, for Python, and we're importing our API client. Um, Getting a trace back, huh? Okay, so uh, if that's not working for you, you can actually just paste in the API key right here. So you can just paste in your own API key, um, or you can just do it right here. So the way you instantiate the API key at the API client is you just give it your API key. So just paste your API key in right there, um, and that's probably the quickest way if you're having some errors around it. Um, if you are using your own notebook at home, what you'll want to do is run these two lines up here. So do you see what this does? It installs the API, it installs the requirements. So it'll install Media Cloud, it'll install a couple other requirements. Um, so uh, Pandas, NumPy, so that might take a minute if you're running it locally. But what this two, you can uncomment those two lines and run them on your local computer and that'll install the requirements. Um, or you can just install Media Cloud yourself with PIP. May I interrupt? It could be that you need to put the the API key in the file as string and not as number. That's why you might get an error. Oh, you think it means those? Like yeah. quotes? Yeah. I don't think so. I think no? PyEnv just loads okay. it. Yeah, let me double check. Okay. So this is going to load my PyEnv. It loaded it. And then if I run the next cell, uh, it worked fine. So. Okay, okay. Then that's okay. Yeah, so um, we can try to help. I mean, debugging notebooks is a giant pain in the rear, um, as we all know. So, um, Matias, are you getting the trace back on uh, the hosted or on your computer? On your computer, yeah. Um, so, for now, you could try the hosted on your computer. Um, if you just put in, if you run those requirements and you put your API key in right here, that should work fine. I'd be surprised if you get a trace back there. Um, yeah, that's weird. Um, does it have the exclamation point in there? I'm not sure why that's not working locally. Uh, the other thing you can do is in your command line, just run pip install dash r requirements.txt. So you can just install that requirements file like normal. Try that and then we can come back in. So uh, if we resolve that problem, <laughs> then uh, what you have is you basically have our convention is to just name our client object MC. Um, and then we use that as our, our client. So at this point, I've created a, an API client. And then right here, I'm just spitting out the version number of the client just as a standard check to make sure it's working. And then a handy method to like sanity check is if you run dot stats, it just gives you some stats about our platform in general. It's not useful information, but it tells you that you're able to uh, query, our, uh, query our API and get results back. So if you have problems in .env, yeah, sure. So back in the setup notebook, right up here, did you try, uh, did you try running these instructions? So you go to file. Yes, yes, yes. You go to so the problem is when I click on file, I do not have the option open from um, part from oh, yeah. Are you local or on the hosted? Um, like are you on your computer or the web? No, 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 I am in my computer. Yes, okay. So are you in, on your computer, are you running Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook? Jupyter Notebook. Okay, yeah. So then if you just go to this folder with a text editor, you can open up uh, the .m file and just edit it with a regular text editor. So, because Jupyter Notebook won't have this, Jupyter Lab will have that. Okay, so could you repeat me this? So go again, go to the which sure. file that up? Go shop? to uh, go to the folder where you checked out these notebooks. Yes. And then open up the .emv file with uh, just a regular text editor. Oh, and I cannot find this one. Hey. Env, right? Yeah, it's it's um, I can show you. It's just this file right here. In the GitHub, you can see the screen share .env. So I download the um, the zip, and when I am yep. zip, I have a list of, of notebooks, but I do not have that one. Okay, 
it may not be showing it to you. So you can also, um, if you, uh, you can also just make it yourself. Um, you can create a new file in there and save it as .env, but depending on your environment, your setup on your computer, it may not be showing you the files that start with dot. Mm -hmm. But maybe, okay, so let's continue and then I can like recheck the video. Okay, sure. So, yeah, you can also just put in, you can, as I said, you can also just paste in your API key as a string. If you look at the screen share, right where it says mediacloud.api.mediacloud, you can paste your string right in here, the API key. Yeah, I did it, but uh, it didn't work. Ah, okay. Hmm. So That's maybe funny. at the end of everything, we can check this and sure. then I can, I can continue so I don't sure. want to great. stop the, the, yes. Okay. So great. So at this point, this notebook is just the one that helps you get connected and make sure it's actually working. So if it's connected at working, then, then this notebook is happy. So what I've done is I basically split these notebooks up just to map, to map the way Ashka talked about the interface. So uh, the second one is just measuring attention. The third is language. The fourth is entities. And then there's some topics one. And then the tenth one is all about sources. So I'll start like she did with Explorer. And uh, these are readable. So you can actually go visit, visit these and it tells you all about them and it links to documentation. So here you can see, um, to measure attention, we basically have two endpoints that are really useful. The first is story count, and that, oops, sorry, that just tells you uh, the same results as you see on the attention line chart on a web interface or the bubble chart. And story list is how you list stories. So the first cell here just loads up a connection again. And this is the meat of what I wanted to talk about. So here's an example where we are checking how many climate change stories, how many stories about climate change were reported in the Washington Post. So if I run that, it's actually gonna query all of the Washington Post, uh, all the dates that we have. And it's telling me that 26,000 stories mention uh, climate change in the Washington Post. You see this is quoted as a, as a phrase, just like you would do in a Boolean search on the web, on the web page. This syntax is documented if you link, um, if you look at how, uh, how to qu our query guide, what you can see here is that we're basically uh, querying media uh, for any stories that are from media ID two. And you can find out those IDs if you visit the source manager tool. And in this case, I did Washington Post. If, but if you look at any um, source, the ID is just right under the name. So you can see right here, Washington Post media source number two. So that's where you can find out these magical IDs for sources and collections are both listed right under the title. And of course, uh, you probably want to time scope your, your query. So there's a really ugly syntax in solar um, for doing time-based queries. So you can do that, but we also have a helper. And this helper down here basically takes Python dates and turns them into this nasty string. <laughs> so it's uh, just a query helper. So in this cell here, I'm just saying, okay, do run all of 2019, run the same query of uh, climate change and Washington Post, and give me uh, the story counts. So it's saying 5,000 stories-ish were published in our database. Um, for 2019 from the Washington Post that mentioned climate change. Of course, you probably want to see that as intention chart. So if you pass in the split variable and you can set it to day, week, month, or year, um, the default I think is day, then suddenly now we've got counts grouped by, in this case, I grouped them by months. So here I'm seeing the results and everything returns in JSON. So this is just parsing it as a nice JSON tree so we can read it. I'm seeing the results broken down by month. And I could turn this into a chart using whatever charting library you like to use. But of course, we tend to argue, like Ashka pointed out, looking at the, the normalized percentage, we tend to argue that it's much better to look at this stuff as normalized percentages, not absolute numbers. Because if you're doing comparisons, then, if you, want, then you want to normalize to be able to compare things. So the next cell just shows you how to do that with the API. So here I'm getting, oops, the first one, I'm getting all the stories that just mentioned climate change in the Washington Post. And the second one here is all the stories in the Washington Post. And then I'm just dividing them. So I'm just doing a standard basic normalization to say that about 4,000, about 4% 4 
of the Washington Post stories from 2019 mentioned climate change, the phrase. So this is how you can replicate um, some of the basic stuff that you see in the API. Um, I don't want to sort of exhaustively go through all of these cells because I think you can look at them yourself. But um, you can also, one of the big advantages is doing things at the collection level. So for collections, you can do the same thing. So if I search over here, if I go back to um, our geographic collections and I go down to you at uh, United States, oops. And if I click on the national United States collection, that magic ID is at the top right there. So now I know 34412234 is my magic number for querying against collections. And if you want to query against collections, you don't use media ID colon something, you use tags ID media. Because you want you don't want you want to look for stories from media sources that are tagged as part of the US national collection. And you'll see as we run through this, we use tags in a lot of different ways in our system. One way we use it is collections. So any media source that we want to have in a collection, we just tag it with that collections ID. So that's exposing, that's being exposed in the query syntax where you want to say um, climate change in any media sources in the national collection. So you do the same thing. You can normalize in the same way here. So here in this cell, I've got two queries. I'm looking at relevant stories to my query versus all the stories we have in our database from the US National Collection. I'm just computing a ratio. And now I can see that two point, roughly 2% 2 of stories in the US media in general were about climate change. So now uh, we can already see that the Washington Post kind of overrepresented here, right? you're seeing more stories in the Washington Post than you'd expect to see about climate change given overall US coverage. So we can do that same kind of investigation. In this case, I do it at a country level and I compare, um, I compare US coverage versus India coverage in India. And I find that at the national level, uh, climate change is covered about half as much as it is in the US based on our data. And I know in the US and in India, we have pretty good English language collections in both that have been well vetted. So I feel comfortable making a statement like this, that the US coverage is clim covers climate change in 2019 about twice as much as India. Now, of course, I only looked at one keyword here, climate change, as Ashka's query looked at a couple different versions, I'd be better fleshing that out more. But very often what you wanna do is get all these stories. And one of the things that we pointed out that people asked about is how do I get, like how big can my query be? So here is a helper function where you can say, okay, get me all those stories. So in this case, I'm getting a sample using the story list method. And story list is very similar to the other methods where you pass in a query, a date range, and then you get back results in JSON. So here I'm getting an actual list of stories that are about climate change in 2019 um, in the United States. And you can see, we actually have a bunch of the stuff included here. We have the URL, we have when we think it was published. Of course, guessing dates is very hard. If we get the date from the AP, from the RSS feed, then we feel pretty confident in it, on it. But if we spidered to a source and guess the date from the raw text on the web, that's hard to do. So it, it, these are caveats that you wanna think about in your research if you're doing very detailed research. In aggregate, it performs well. If you're trying to make statements about individual stories, then you're really better off double checking things because, um, uh, because you know, as you know, in large big data projects, the closer you get to the data, the more noise you'll see. And the more aggregate the statements you make, the, the, the more confidence you can have in them. So this is just giving me a random set of stories, but if you wanna, if you wanna get all the stories, I built a helper function here. So this is the sort of thing where if you wanna get all the stories that match a query of yours, you can just copy and paste this and use this function. What it does is it pages through the stories. Um, and I won't go into details about how we page through, you can read the documentation there. But th here's an example where I'm saying, okay, let's fetch all the stories from January of 2020 that, uh, that match um, the climate change query. Oops. I forgot to run that there. So now it's going to go ahead and it's going to page through uh, all the results. 
uh, and then give me a set of all the URLs and all the other information. And this can take a while, uh, which is why uh, we tend to say if you want to do bigger things, you should write Python notebooks for them. Um, Of course, you probably want to write dump that to a CSV. So I also wrote a helper that just dumps it out to a CSV once it's done. So I think it's got one or two more pages. Let's see here. It's almost done. That's a lot of stories, huh? There we go. So we just fetched 6,000 stories. And this is just a standard helper to write things to a CSV with a dict writer. Um, so I'm dumping that. And now I've got a CSV. It should show up in a second on the left. And I can load it up in pandas and verify that it looks right. So now I've got a CSV of all the stories that match my query. This is like the number one thing that people use Media Cloud to do is to get a bunch of URLs that they then process through their own pipeline. Um, so this is how you do that. And this sample function here, all matching stories, this is, the fun, this is the magic sauce for just getting all the stories that match a URL. Now, you, if you try to do too many, you'll run, get, you'll run up against an API quota limit, right? So I think our quota is defaults to 100,000 stories per week. Um, I don't remember exactly. But if you hit something like that, just email us and tell us about what you're trying to do. Sometimes we can help do it more efficiently. Or in some cases, people want like, you know, 10 million URLs for some study they're doing. Uh, if they seem like a legit person that's not, you know, trying to like study things to create more disinformation out there, um, then we can run a batch job. And in a couple of days, we can send someone a giant CSV dump as well, if you are doing like a deep dive on a study. But for most things, this works great. Any, I'll pause there. Any questions about attention? Nope. Okay. Um, so then again, at the top, you can see there's documentation about those API methods. For language, I'll just give a simple example here. Word count just gives you word counts um, and you call it the same way. Um, you pass in a query and a date range and it just gives you back word counts. Now, it's important to know that these are sampled word counts. Um, you can set the sample size. We find that five to 10, like uh, between 1,000 and 5,000 is pretty representative for most things. So that's what we do in our web interface. But if you want to be to like to run it yourself and run a 5,000 and a 10,000 story sample, you can look at how the, the top 10 doesn't change very much. The placement of them changes a little bit, but the top 10 doesn't change very much. If you're working in different languages, you'll want to just double check how our stemming works. We use Solar underneath the hood for this, and it handles uh, like most languages, um, but you'll want to be very sensitive to the type of st stemming it's doing um, to make sure it's doing it correctly. Uh, and in this case, you can see that the stem and the term, this term is the most used version of the stem that came back in the, in the query results. Um, I'll just nod to the fact that you can create a term document matrix. So uh, if you are doing something like training an LP pipeline or something like that, instead of fetching, we can't give you raw stories, but we can give you bag of words types results. So we have a word story matrix that gives you a sparse matrix with all of the, the story IDs and which top terms they used. So then you can use that to build something like a TF-IDF stage of a NLP pipeline. And then there's an example of using themes as well, those, uh, those, those word to vec themes that we mentioned. Um, so if you wanted to fetch those, you can as well. So uh, I'll breeze through the entities example as well. Um, and this is important here to note that we use tagging, as I said, for most things in our system. Entities are tags on stories in our database. So the same story tag count method you can use for any of our tagging stuff. So themes, um, people, organizations, places, uh, all of those are implemented as tags. So the story tag count endpoint is the one you care about. And story tag count, just like all our other methods, 
takes a query, a date range, and in this case, you have to tell it what set of tags you care about. So tags are organized um, into sets. And all of the people tags are in one set. All the organizational tags are in another set. All the geographic tags are in another set. So basically, when you specify a tag set, you're saying, tell me the top tags used on stories that match my query within this set. So in this case, I'm saying, give me all of the, um, the top places, the top people that are tagged in 2019 um, in the stories that match my query. And this is actually January of 2019. And this is just US national queries, just as US national stories. And you get back a count of how many times it was used on stories, um, the text of the tag. So this is Donald Trump. And you get back some other information like the tag ID, which can be helpful if you want to search for stories. So the same thing is true of organizations and places. Uh, the key about places is that these are actually disambiguated. So there's a little bit of documentation about how we do that. Um, you can do all of the exact same things for topics. Um, and the topics notebooks show exactly how to do that. I think what I want to do is just talk about the MC10, the sources and collections API endpoints, and then maybe troubleshoot with folks that are, that are trying to use these notebooks. I think that's what I'll do next. So I'm going to jump ahead and just show you that there's a bunch of different ways. Sometimes the thing people want to do is they want to say, oh, uh, I actually just want to find out all the sources that were within your, um, find out more about all the sources within your collection that covers Poland or something. So in, in this notebook, I have examples about how to do things like that. So you can find uh, media based on its URL. So this example is, oh, show me all of the media that match Hindustan Times. And usually the first one is the one you care about. Um, so you can see here, we get a lot of stories. This is the um, sort of canonical Hindustan Times uh, media source in our database. And the thing you care about is the ID. So you can also search by metadata. So this is, gets at some of some of the questions people were asking earlier. Media are categorized in our collections that are geographic by some manual things like where they're published and some automated things like what language they publish in. So for instance, you can do this in Explorer, but you can also do this in the API. So say you wanted to search against all of the Indian publications published in English. Um, you can do that here with this sort of complicated syntax, but you can also do it in Explorer just by navigating the drop downs in the media picker where you add more media. So in this case, I'm trying to list, uh, these are the first 20 or so stories, uh, sources that publish from India in English language, but you can also page through them. So say you wanted to download these for a report you're writing. Um, you can, we don't have a quick way to download something like this in the web tools. So in the API, you can say, grab all of the media sources that are published in India in English, and then dump those to a CSV. So now I've got a CSV that is, gives me all of the information. And this is the sort of things that you want to include in like a, an appendix or a data repo for a study that you're writing or publishing. Many of our sources, the vast majority um, of, uh, of regular sources where we're getting stories every day, um, we pull in through RSS feeds. And our object hierarchy is kind of like media sources have feeds and stories are associated with them. That's about 70,000 sources uh, that we do every day. Now, of course, RSS is dying, so we're switching to a model where we can pull in sitemaps. We're still playing with that. The key wrinkle is how to tell story content from other content, right? Like how do you tell what an about page is or an ad page compared to a story? So we're still working on that. But we've done experiments where we can pull in uh, sitemaps and get a high quantity and a high quality of historical information. But uh, this shows you how to figure out what feeds we're pulling from. Um, the next set of things shows you uh, how to get information about collections. So if I grab um, all of the, I can see that our geographic collections are actually implemented as tags. And there's a tag set that holds all the geographic uh, collections in it. 
So I know it's kind of confusing to think about tags, how we use them for so many things. But if you're familiar with software architecture, this will kind of make sense to you. So media sources are tagged as part of collections. Um, and collections are grouped together into tag sets. So here I'm finding all of the geographic tag sets. And you can actually page through them, just like everything else. So these are just some of them. You can page through them, and this is the equivalent of this page. So the results you see here are basically what I just queried for by saying, give me all of the geographic collections that are part of the geographic collection tag set. So it's not encoded into a hierarchy, but you can kind of fudge it with some hacks. Um, and as an example of that here. And then I have some examples of, of how to like get all of the other different tags. So that's a quick walkthrough of this. I think maybe I'll pause here rather than continue to exhaust 